we do. We start with studying program behavior. Uh, and I, I tend to make an analogy here where you know people with kids actually think that I'm wrong. But uh, I think that the, these systems are like a baby. You, know, you, you, you create the baby, and then it kind of works, but you don't really know how it works, and it evolves over time, and uh, you don't really understand what's going on. But you have to observe and study. And once you've done that, you can hope to achieve discipline by avoiding bad behaviors and enforcing good behaviors. And finally, since we are in computer science, uh, one of the additional things we can do is uh, having developed some mechanisms to avoid and enforce, uh, we might hope to even more or less formally prove uh, the discipline that has been achieved. And this is interesting to me because uh, proving things about uh, large-scale software is still something sort of outside the reach of the methods we have today. So what do we do in these three steps? The, the areas that I'm most interested in with respect to studying program behavior relate to uh, automating the test process. Uh, and in the context of testing, we're really uh, focusing on software fault injection. You know, poke the system, see how it reacts. Uh, and this is a good way to determine what a system will do uh, when you deploy it in the real world, in a real environment. In the context of the uh, second step, uh, we work on techniques for failure immunity, and this will be the main topic for uh, today's talk. Uh, and we are also working on smarter ways of debugging software, in particular concurrent software. Uh, that's something that uh, you know, we, we tend to think sequentially, and uh, it's hard to reason about concurrent executions. So we need debugging tools that can collapse the, that concurrency into a sequential line of thought. Uh, we're also doing work on automatically reverse engineering software uh, as a way to extract what the software does and then re-encode it into a new piece of software that achieves the same goal but doesn't have all the bugs that the previous uh, software had. And finally, there's various techniques for program steering that are needed for all of these uh, three things. And you will see some examples of that in the talk. And finally, uh, I'm very interested in scalable proof techniques. Uh, I'm not talking about inventing new formal methods here. I'm not a theoretician, but rather bridging the gap between the techniques that have been developed and applied to 1,000, maybe 10,000 lines of code and bridging them to millions of lines of code uh, and understanding what are the trade-offs in doing that. And if we have time at the end, I'll be happy to uh, talk in more depth about any of these. But today, I will focus on failure immunity. Uh, and let me, to, to explain what that is, I will illustrate with a very simple example to develop the intuition. Uh, you can uh, see here uh, the, the lifetime of a real software system. Uh, time runs from left to right. And uh, it, the system can be in one of two states, either running or failed. And then the system runs for a while. A bug hits or some sort of failure brings the system down. System is down for a while while it recovers, either manually or automatically. Resumes operation. Some other bug may hit, bring the system down. Uh, and here's the interesting part. If the same bug that hit before hits again, the system will dutifully do, do the exact same thing it did previously. In other words, it has learned nothing from past experience. And that is what we try to uh, address with failure immunity. So let's go through the same example again, but this time we have an immune system. Uh, the system runs, uh, it's hit by the bug, it goes down, and now we don't just uh, allow the system to recover, but also save what we refer to as an antibody. Uh, this antibody matches the bug that just hit. Uh, now we do the same for the, for the blue bug and uh, allow the system to uh, recover. And now when the yellow bug hits, we use that originally saved antibody to neutralize the bug and allow the system to continue unharmed. So this is the general idea of failure immunity. Yes, question. Uh, 
So that's, that's a very good point. And actually, as you will see later, uh, the issue of what, how much of the program state you look at is very important. And you will see how we get around that in, in the uh, example I'm going to work through. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is how we apply this concept to the problem of avoiding deadlocks. Uh, I will give you an overview of Diminix, which is a tool we built to impart this kind of immunity to uh, software systems, uh, both Java and C++. I'll talk about some of the challenges we face, the solutions we came up with, and then towards the end, I'll broaden the view and show you some other areas where we're applying the same idea of failure immunity. Uh, I guess, you know, it's, in this audience, it's probably not necessary to argue why deadlocks are, uh, you know, a, such a big deal. Yeah, I do want to point out, though, with the second bullet here. Uh, this is important because imagine you are developing a web browser and you do all the static analysis in the world and you have the perfect tools and you, you build a perfect web browser that has absolutely no deadlock bugs. And you ship this browser out there and the users put in I don't know, a shockwave plugin and this plugin and the other plugin and these plugins themselves are outside your control. And at least with current web browser architectures, these plugins can lock your browser. They, they can deadlock. So all the work you have done to make your browser work well does not necessarily mean that the user will not experience hangs. So uh, the, these are, this illustrates the uh, limitation that exists in uh, sort of tools that require source code, namely tools that the developers use. And we need to sort of expand this to tools that users can use as well. And you will understand later why this, you know, how we address this in Diminix. If you think about, you know, yeah, deadlocks are hard to fix, they're hard to avoid. Um, what will happen as we go forward? I think things will just get worse because on one hand, hardware is getting increasingly more parallel. So legacy code is, in, is experiencing increasingly more concurrent executions. So latent bugs that perhaps were not, that have not surfaced so far, will surface more and more. In addition to that, we're pushing programmers to write increasingly more parallel software to match the parallel hardware. So that probably means that there'll be more bugs introduced. So I think going forward, uh, deadlocks are here to stay. So the idea behind deadlock immunity is straightforward. You watch the execution of a program. Uh, you learn which executions lead to deadlock. Then you save fingerprints of the, the execution patterns you've observed. You save them into a persistent history. And subsequently, you avoid uh, those patterns, those execution patterns that have led to deadlocks uh, in the past. So let me walk you through an example. You don't need to read the code, despite the fact that you can actually see the text. Uh, that's not usually the case. Um, there, these are two functions, NL close, NL shutdown on the two sides of the screen. They can run in two parallel threads. And this, I, what I will illustrate, is a real bug from uh, the Hawk NL library, which is a networking library for distributed games. Uh, the essence lies in these statements, which present a textbook case of lock inversion. If they run in two parallel threads at the same time, uh, they can deadlock. And if you think about it, these run in the context of a call sequence. Uh, so you see NL close there at the top, and then they'll shut down in the second thread. They make the respective calls, and you know, NL close will eventually uh, end up doing a pthread mutex lock underneath the covers. Once the call returns up the stack, uh, it will make its second call, trying to acquire the second mutex, and so on and so forth. Now, if you abstract away the parameters that are being passed around, what you're looking at is a call pattern. It's, it's a sequence of control flow that has led to the deadlock. Right? And we're not looking at any of the data values uh, here right now. And in fact, we can get more precise by indicating specifically where those calls were made. Okay? So here you have uh, file name, line number, uh, indicating that we're interested in the call that was made for instance, the NL shutdown that was called from line 553 in NL.C, perhaps it's called from other places as well. So that's not uh, what we want to capture in the pattern. 
One side note is that uh, we actually do not look at source code. What we use are offsets within the executable, but I think it's more intuitive to think in terms of file name line number. So if you look at this, you see that the NL close acquires a lock on the outside, so the outer lock, what we can think of as the outer lock. And NL shutdown acquires an outer lock as well. And then the two threads try to acquire their inner locks. And the control flow that leads to the acquisition of the outer locks is what we refer to as the deadlock pattern. Now, the idea is that the deadlock bug will lead to uh, a deadlock pattern. And then the deadlock pattern can lead to a wide variety of manifestations of this bug, which are the hangs. Uh, usually, one bug leads to one pattern. Uh, there are cases where it can lead to multiple. And in, in practice, the, the largest number of patterns we've seen result from one bug is three. So in essence, the number of patterns is small. So if we avoid the patterns, we can hope to avoid the effects of the bug without really doing anything about the bug itself. So with that general overview, uh, let me talk about Diminix, the tool that actually does this, and we'll go into more depth uh, as we look at the tool. Uh, there are four things that Diminix has to do. One is intercept the low-level calls to lock and unlock that the program uh, makes. Uh, it detects deadlocks automatically at runtime. Then whenever deadlock does happen, it must save the deadlock pattern to the history, this persistent history file, and then avoid subsequently all executions that match these saved patterns. So in essence, Diminix is using the history of patterns as an immune system. Right? These patterns are those antibodies I was mentioning earlier in the talk. So now I'll go step by step through these uh, four um, things that Diminix does. In terms of interception, we have currently three versions, three implementations of this. Uh, the first one we started out with was direct instrumentation of the binary. And this is how Diminix for Java works. Right? You, you look at the, the large piece of code, I mean the, the byte code, and then you see the various monitor, enter, monitor, exits, and uh, lock and unlock, and those get instrumented uh, so that Diminix gains control every time a lock and unlock is done, or a monitor, enter, monitor, exit in this case. A second version is to take the existing thread library that the program uses, such as the pthread library, and extend it with immunity uh, capabilities. And that's what we did for the Linux native POSIX threads library and for uh, one of the shared libraries on FreeBSD, uh, both of these being pthread library, libraries. Now, it turned out that these two approaches, while they work fine for a research prototype, when it comes to installing it, you know, having some end user uh, put this on their machine, it's a fair amount of overhead, you know, sort of ripping out your existing pthreads library and putting in a new one or you know, instrumenting the program, uh, these are uh, fair, you know, it takes some skill. And so we developed the third version, which is simply using a shim library that using the LD preload mechanism gets in between the application and the threading library underneath. So here there's really nothing to do but to set an environment variable. Now, the benefits of all these three in, uh, interception techniques is that Diminix requires no assistance from programmers. You don't have to annotate the code. You don't have to change the way you write the code. And in fact, programmers should probably be oblivious to the presence of Diminix to start with. Right? You don't want them to know that there's something that will you know, catch uh, some of the bugs they leave in. You still want them to strive for good code. There's no assistance from users because the detection, as we'll see later, is done automatically. And because of all this, we don't need source code. And to me, since I'm, you know, I, I really want these things to be deployed, I think this is, this is a huge deal because now it means we can take Diminix and apply it to commercial closed source software. Uh, you can imagine applying to all the software you run on your machines. Deadlock detection, which is the second thing that Diminix does, uh, it's no rocket science. We use a resource allocation graph. There are two kinds of nodes, thread nodes and lock nodes. And what I'll walk you through is an example for the Hawk and L bug, which is, in essence, the simplest way in which a program can deadlock. 
So to, uh, don't worry about the different colors of the edges. That's not uh, essential. Uh, T1 will request and eventually acquire lock L1. This was the, you know, the first thread. The second thread then will request and acquire its lock. Uh, and then T2 will block waiting for L1, and T1 will block waiting for L2, and we have a cycle, and you know, this kind of textbook way of detecting deadlocks. So now we've detected the deadlock, but there's really nothing you can do about it. The deadlock occurred, so you'll have to you know, restart the program or micro-reboot it or, or roll it back. Uh, but the best you can do at this point is to save some information about what happened in order to avoid this deadlock the next time it comes around. There isn't enough information in here, so I'll show you what Dimunix does. In addition to just having these edges, it captures as labels on what we call these hold edges, the call stack the thread had at the time it acquired the lock. So here you see that when T1 acquired L1, it had this call stack, which originated at NL close. And when T2 acquired L2, it had this call stack. So now when T2 and T1 block and Dimunix detects the cycle, it will walk around the cycle, collect these labels, and form a signature out of the labels. So in this case, you see two, uh, two labels, two call stacks, because there are only two threads involved. But if there are multiple threads, these signatures would have multiple call stacks. And then the signature is placed in the history uh, for subsequent uh, avoidance. Now, as I suggested earlier, uh, the issue of how the program recovers does not change now that Dimunix is there. You recover whichever you'd have recovered previously as well. It's completely orthogonal to the discussion uh, we're having here today. So let's see how we avoid these, uh, uh, how do we avoid the, the particular signature we just acquired. We have the two threads on the left calling NL close, NL shutdown, and then we have an interleaved execution of, um, uh, of, of the program, and the first time uh, the program gets into pthread mutex lock is over here, and that is where Diminix now gains control of the execution because this mutex lock is, is instrumented or intercepted. So Diminix will look at the call stack, compare it to the signatures in the history, and find a partial match over here. But it's just a partial match, so there's no danger yet. It allows the thread to continue executing. And let's say in the meantime, the second thread gets to pthread mutex lock. Dimunix now intercepts the execution for a second time, gets the call stack, and now it has a full match on the signature. This means that the thread number two cannot actually be allowed to move ahead. It's dangerous to do so. So Dimunix. Uh, suspends it temporarily, which now allows the first thread to acquire its second mutex, which, by the way, this guy was trying to get over here, right? But we suspended it before actually acquiring the mutex. And eventually, the first thread will make a call to mutex unlock that matches the outer uh, acquisition of a lock. And at this point, Dimunix will unmatch, if I may make up a verb, uh, this part of the signature, which means now we do not have a signature that is completely matched. That means we can give the green light to the second thread, which then goes ahead, acquires its locks, and has completed execution uh, deadlock free. Now you see what's happening here is that we are, if the, if the two threads end up running at the same time in a way that has caused deadlock in the past, we just try to delay them a little bit so that they can uh, proceed. Now, what is avoidance in a more abstract sense? You have a particular program, and it can experience a set of different thread schedules. And of these schedules, one subset leads to deadlock, and another subset does not lead to deadlock. So what Diminix tries to do is avoid the subset that leads to deadlock and tries to figure out what that subset is by observing prior executions. So we want to see if this works for uh, real systems. Um, we took, yes, Jeff. Yeah, quick question. So um, you know, part of the whole picture is that uh, applications need to be rewritten to be able to recover from deadlock. And do you find that it is the case that applications have been, have been written to be able to recover from these things? 
not the ones we looked at. <laughs> So there are. So again, you know whether they recover or not is, it's kind of orthogonal to avoiding future occurrences. In fact, I would even argue that trying to avoid future occurrences of the deadlock is more compelling for applications that cannot recover from them, because you're trying to avoid giving them opportunity to recover. Uh, now, it is it is true that if they could recover in some smooth way. So for instance, if there was some checkpoint rollback mechanism, uh, it would be even better because then that first instance of the deadlock that does occur that we require in order to learn the signature, even at that point you could say, oh, just go back. Right? So it, it, you wouldn't even incur the downtime of that. But then you know, the question is, well, what's higher overhead to avoid or to roll back every time you hit the deadlock? I guess it depends. Say the application has been written to recover from deadlock. Is there anything that you can do because you need because you need deadlock to happen in the first place, and then you need the application to recover from it for you to do some billing? Um, if the application wasn't written, does that sort of prevent Linux from from working in the first place? Or is there some so that, that's a very good question because it, it's so a good opportunity to clarify. Um, consider the application without the Unix. It runs, it deadlocks, then you say you restart it, it runs, it deadlocks again, you restart it, and so on and so forth. With the Munix, the application runs, it deadlocks, you restart it, and then it runs, and runs, and runs, and runs. Okay, so this is a cross execution. Yes, so that, that's, that's, that's very important, right? It is, uh, we're, in this, let's just assume that the application restarted, now the signatures carry on from one execution to the next, and that represents this immune system, right? The antibodies that, uh, I guess there's no analogy for living beings, but uh, really this is what, and you will see that it is, there's certain trade-offs we need to make for, to keep the signatures portable from one execution to the next. So you handle relocations and things like that? Relocations of the code or? Yes, that, that's easy to deal with. As long as blocks of kernel relocate within the application, it's, it's fine. Because we look at the offset, so they're relative to the beginning. So does this work for uh, real code? We took a bunch of systems, uh, both C, C++ systems and Java systems. Uh, some of these are as real as it gets, for instance, MySQL uh, runs in production in very, very many places. Uh, Apache ActiveMQ is also something we know less about, but is used. It's a message queue, uh, uh, infrastructure, message queuing infrastructure. And some of these are also very big. So MySQL has over a million lines of code. And what did we do? We said, let's take a look at the bug databases and look for end user reported deadlocks, real deadlocks, okay? Not stuff we made up. And then what we try to do is reproduce these deadlocks. Now that was you know, very labor intensive. We had to give up on a good number of, of bugs, but we were able to reproduce some of them, about a dozen. And here are some examples of them. By reproduce, I mean develop a test case that using timing loops and various other tricks can deterministically make that deadlock manifest. And, it, and now you understand why it's so difficult, because these deadlocks are, uh, you know, loosely speaking, very non-deterministic, because they depend on various uh, scheduling events. But for these, we managed to uh, make them happen. And then we ran these test cases, say, you know, 100 times for each one, and it deadlocked 100 times with the system in question. Then we did the same experiment, but applied the Munix to the system, to MySQL, SQLite, whatever, uh, the experiment was with, and it deadlocked the first time, and in the 99 subsequent cases, it didn't deadlock anymore. So we use that as empirical evidence that Dimunix has actually been able to acquire immunity against these real deadlock bugs. Now there's another category of problems that we cannot call bugs, 
and I refer to them as deadlock traps. Uh, the JDK and I imagine other uh, runtime uh, libraries also provide what's called, uh, what, what they call synchronized collections. The idea is that you are, you know, you, you maybe you want to write a program and you want to write it using threads and you don't want to worry about concurrent accesses to uh, collections. So the programmer needs to be insulated from the complexity of writing concurrent programs. So what the JDK does underneath is say you have a vector, uh, if you operate on one of these vectors, it will first acquire the lock underneath transparently to the programmer, perform the operation and uh, release the lock. And what can happen if you have, for instance, two vectors, V1 and V2, uh, and there's a method, for instance, add all that copies all the elements from one vector to the other. Let's say in one thread you call v1.addall v2, uh, that will lock v1 and lock v2, and then copy the elements from v2 to v1. Now if you just so happen to do a v2.addall v1 in another thread, it will lock v2, then lock v1, which is in the opposite order. So such a program, while technically correct, it can deadlock the JDK. And if the JDK deadlocks, then the entire program is stuck. So we chose five classes in the JDK, wrote simple test cases that evidence this behavior, uh, these, these five classes here on the left. And then again, we ran the program without the Munix and with the Munix uh, and found that the Munix was able to get around these types of deadlock traps as well. So both real deadlocks and uh, deadlock traps. So with that evidence in hand, let me start talking about some of the challenges. I'll look at performance, uh, I'll look at the issue of induced starvation, and then I'll talk a little bit about false positives and the, the precision of calibration. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, there, we do have a paper describing uh, most of this work in uh, OSDI, and there's a number of interesting issues described in there that I will not have time to talk about today. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe offline we can go into more depth. The first issue that comes to mind is performance. Diminix does a lot of work behind the scenes, and doing that in the critical path is problematic. We tried a number of different architectures and converged onto a highly asynchronous one that tries to take as much of the hard work out of the critical path and put it into a separate thread that runs asynchronously. Uh, so here is a, uh, a architectural diagram. Don't worry so much about all the details. The, in green, you have the original program. In red, you have the instrumentation that was applied to that program. And then in the blue box over here uh, is where Dimunix does most of the heavy lifting, you know, and maintaining the resource allocation graph, searching for cycles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the the key feature of this architecture is that the application itself is uh, decoupled from the Dimunix uh, monitor thread uh, through this lock-free asynchronous event queue. So this allows the program to do as much of its work un unhindered by Dimunix as possible. So we wanted to see if this architecture pays off and what we did is run a thread-intensive microbenchmark that reports lock operations per second, so essentially lock throughput. And then we uh, generated a, a history of 64 synthetic deadlock signatures. Now, why did we have to generate it? Well, this, dead, this benchmark does not have any deadlocks. So we just randomly chose sets of call stacks in the program and said, well, you know, this call stack corresponds to a deadlock. You should avoid it. And we varied the number of threads from 2 to 1,024, number of threads in the experiment. And we measured the uh, throughput we got on the benchmark without the Munich, which is the blue line, and with the Munich, which is the orange line. Now, the distance between the two lines is the overhead incurred by the presence of the Munich. Not surprisingly, the highest overhead is for the highest number of threads, and in fact, that is 4.5%, uh, and the, the lowest overhead is over here. Now, if you look at the gray line, this shows you the number of thread suspends per second induced by Dimunix. So it is 
in effect, a measure of de Munich's activity uh, in holding up various threads. Uh, and in essence, it's a, it's a reflection of the avoidance work. And this grows linearly with the number of threads. You know, this x-axis is logarithmic. So uh, that's why you see it go up like that. Now, you cannot take everything out of the critical path. There are certain decisions that have to be made synchronously, namely whether to suspend the thread or not. And to make that decision, de Munich has to be able to match the current call stack to the history. So that has to be in the critical path. And because it's in the critical path, we want to make it go as fast as possible. So we use two tricks. One is to represent the history as a hash table uh, in which which you use in the following way. You get the call stack, you hash the call stack instead of comparing frame by frame. You hash the entire call stack and use that to probe the hash table. If there's nothing there, which is the common case, that means that that call stack does not appear in any of the signatures in the history. So you're done. You just move on. If there is something there, then the, given how we maintain these data structures, it will be a list of the threads that are potentially conflicting with the current thread. And by potentially conflicting, I mean they have matched the other parts of some signature that this call stack is part of. So then you can make the decision uh, as to whether to suspend or not. The bottom line is that this operation is amortized O of one uh, lookup. So it, it's very uh, efficient. And in particular, one of the things we're worried about is that it, it is independent of history size. Because as the program runs over the lifetime of a program, it may accumulate more and more signatures. And you don't want the program to become slower and slower as the history gets bigger and bigger. And another trick we use is to uh, employ a thread local cache of some of the data structures. This helps us eliminate contention, especially you know, when you have a large number of threads. Jack? Uh, so it is not incremental, and it, that, is an, that is not much of a problem because we actually catch the stacks all the way at the bottom. So they're always intercepted in when they enter the POSIX threads library or when they actually do the lock. So, you know, the, the calls happen, and then at the bottom we take a look at the backtrace. Uh, but, in fact, the, the overhead we do incur is mostly due to the computation of the hash. So computing the hash is something we have to do, and it's, uh, you know, especially in Java, where you use get stack trace, and it returns a vector of strings, uh, and it has to allocate them, and so, you know, in, in Java, it's a little more overhead. So actually, you know, the graph I showed you was for uh, the pthreads version. In Java, the overhead can go as high as about, I think, 14%. Now, we want to see what happens if the history varies in size. So we ran the exact same micro benchmark I showed you earlier. Now the scale here is, uh, you know, is sort of expanded so that we can see the, the lines better. And we varied the number of signatures from 2 to 256. So this sort of simulates a history that grows over time. And the good news is that the uh, overhead stays relatively flat, not surprising, you know, given the implementation I just described. I should point out that having 256 signatures in a history is probably unrealistically large, because that means you have more than 200 deadlocks in your program. And for, you know, today, I think it's unrealistic to expect such a crappy program to run. Perhaps when we get to 20 million lines of code, 30 million lines of code, that may happen. So I think, really, we're looking at something in this range for today's systems. But you know, the good news is we have margin for uh, expansion there. Yes? Uh, do you have a sense for how portable the signal signatures might be across installation? In the sense that, well, you know, just like we have bug reports, we can have deadlock reports. And, you know, so it just, it just needs to be the case that somebody somewhere encounters a deadlock. And then that can be essentially broadcast in the same way bug reports are broadcast so that everybody can pick it up and have it come right automatically. Mm -hmm. well, So let me shelve that question, and I will come back to it, and you'll probably snicker when you see the slide. 
But if I don't address the question, please, we should come back to it. So the second issue is uh, that of induced starvation. Any time you use yields or suspends to g work around deadlocks, you run the risk of inducing, uh, you know, creating a situation where a threat actively yields, waiting for something to change, and that something never changes. So it's not a deadlock per se, but it is kind of equivalent to an induced deadlock. So that's a problem, right? We have to deal with it. Uh, it we never encountered it in our tests, but it is possible to construct an example and in which this happens, and I will do that with, with what I think is the simplest case in which this induced starvation can happen. So I take the same Hawk and L example we looked at before, but I add one lock, which is held by uh, T1. So this is, a, this is a third lock in the story. And you know T2 holds L2, and now T1 wants to acquire L1. Uh, Dominic sees that there's a match, so he says, okay, UT1 has to, have to sus be suspended. And the reason it's suspended is because of that call stack up there. So T2 is holding this lock with a call stack that matches the other half of the signature. So as long as that other half is matched, T1 cannot proceed. But now what if T2 wants to acquire L3? T1 is waiting for T2 to get out of that call stack, and T2 is now waiting for T1 to release L3. So this situation will, you know, it's, it's a starvation condition or, or deadlock, however you, way you may want to call it. But to show you how we deal with that, let me take one step back here. We want to capture the suspension in the graph. So when we ask T1 to suspend, we add an edge, what we call a yield edge, uh, in the graph pointing from T1 to T2 as T2 being the cause of this yield. And to complete the cause, we copy over that call stack that's really what's bothering T1. So now we have this edge with the call stack on it. If the deadlock involves multiple threads, you'd have multiple yield edges uh, going from T1 to each thread with the respective call stacks. Now when T2 wants to acquire L3, Dominix will find a cycle. And it does the exact same thing it did in the case of deadlock cycles. It walks around this cycle, collects these call stacks, and forms a signature out of it. And this is a signature of the starvation condition, i.e., a pattern that has to be avoided in the future. So you see, we're using the exact same mechanism to detect and avoid starvation conditions, the same mechanism used for deadlocks. If you think about what's happening is that the program's running and it hits a deadlock, and then, as I was saying, it's too late to do anything about deadlock at that point, so Diminix knows it has to avoid that deadlock one step back. And in doing that, it hits this starvation condition. So now it knows it needs to avoid this one step back. So again, it, it sort of uh, steps out of these paths that are deadlock prone until it finds a path that is actually uh, safe from deadlocks or at least has not encountered deadlocks in the past. And you see how this is a monotonically, uh, this monotonically reduces the number of steps, you know, the distance from uh, the deadlock. And the third issue is that of false positives and the precision of the matching we do. Now, what I've shown you so far was just part of the story. I was showing you these, these call sequences, but really there's added layers of program that we're looking at. So the result of this is that the signatures will look more like this. They'll have the entire call stack in there. This is okay because you know, we could just say Diminix should match the entire call stack before triggering avoidance. And that means that any time this same sequence will be executed, we will no longer let the program go down that path. The issue is one of generality, though. It doesn't matter where NL shutdown is called from, right? The bug is in NL shutdown. So if NL shutdown gets called from server shutdown or some other method, while someone else calls NL close, the same risk exists. So what we would like to do is decide to only match a subset of the frames in the signature 
so as to capture this deadlock pattern in its full generality. But I would argue that knowing this ahead of time is, uh, is uh, undecidable. So we need to do, you know, we need to find some heuristic way of figuring out the exact number of frames we want here. Now what happens if we just go ultra general and say, well, let's just match two frames or just one frame. If you, let's take the one frame example. If you just match on uh, that one frame, you'll end up serializing all access to P3 mutex lock, which is perfectly correct. Uh, but the performance will be affected. And that's what we call false positives, right? So you end up avoiding purported deadlocks that if you had not avoided them, they would not occur. That's a false positive. The effect of false positives is purely a performance concern, not a, not a correctness concern. Ironically, false positives are not always a cause for drop in performance. We have seen instances where false positives actually improve performance because they reduce contention. Uh, it was, you know, once we saw it, we were like, duh, yes, it can happen. But it was kind of surprising when we first saw the numbers. Now, I should say that there is a second source of false positives besides the precision I was mentioning, which is input dependencies. For, for some combination of inputs, you might deadlock. For a different combination, you might not deadlock. You can imagine just passing in the locks as arguments to a function. Okay? We haven't seen this much in, in practice, but again, it can happen. So let me talk first about the precision adjustment. We have the following heuristic algorithm. When Diminix is, so Diminix suspends a thread, and there are these other threads that conflicted with it and are allowed, therefore, to continue. Diminix will now track the lock and unlock activity of these other threads. And after suspending this thread over here, it will track its lock and unlock activity as well. And then it looks at these logs. And if there's no lock inversion between the potentially conflicting threads, it concludes that maybe this was a false positive under the assumption that the suspended thread would have done what it did even if it hadn't been suspended. So if there are no lock inversions, it says, well, this was probably a false positive, uh, so it bumps up the precision of matching. It increases the number of frames that that signature uh, must match. Now, as I say, it's a heuristic. It's not sound not, nor complete, but it's a way to try to triangulate onto the right number of frames. And the moment the improvement in false positive rate is, uh, the moment increasing precision does not improve the false positive rate, we stop. And at that point, I say, okay, that's sort of what looks like the right amount, uh, the right number of frames. With respect to input dependencies, we do not deal with them. And this comes back to the issue of portability of signatures. Concrete program state will change during an execution, and especially from one execution to the next. Lock IDs, thread IDs, all of these things change. So we cannot capture them inside the signatures, or else the signature in a subsequent run may lead to a false negative, which is a lot worse than a false positive. So we just capture the control flow information. It's purely based on control flow. And we pay the cost of some false positive rates, uh, some false positive rate that is due to these input dependencies. Now, as I said, this is minimal. We've actually run benchmarks on, on real systems, uh, MySQL, and so on. And we see very few false positives that are caused by uh, by inputs, but that's a cost to be aware of. So there are two features that I want to mention. One is that sometimes you may not want to really avoid all the deadlock patterns you've seen in the past. And I'll give you the worst possible example. Again, not one we've seen in practice, but it could happen. Remember I was saying that we take one step back, you know, avoid you know, starvation condition, step back, now what if you hit another starvation condition and another and you sort of bubble up to, the, to some top of an execution tree? Let's say that's the execution, that's the root of the execution tree that implements, say, your, your file menu in Word. And because all those paths are deadlock prone, 
the result is that Dimunix will trim them away and not allow you to execute it, which means you'll click on the file menu and nothing happens. You click again and nothing happens. So that is a case where you might say, oh, actually I'm better off just disabling that signature and not worrying about the deadlock. It may happen, but at least I want to use my file menu. So there are two ways to do this in Dimunix. One is manual, another one is automatic. Uh, we have till 11 o'clock. And I will skip over this. Um, if we have time offline, I, will, I can give you more details. But does this mean, won't it occur only if uh, every time you click file, there is query going by deadlock? It will occur if you've clicked on the file menu, and in the past, that execution led to a deadlock and then led to a starvation and to a starvation and another starvation and so on. So there, a lot of things have to come together for this to happen, which is probably why we haven't seen it in practice. But it is theoretically possible. And this is the slide that I, I think addresses what both of you were mentioning. Um, and the insight that, that you had was, well, it's not necessary for a program to experience the deadlock in order to be able to avoid the deadlock. Right? We take again the browser example. You have millions of these browsers running out there. They're all copies of the exact same program and they have the exact same bugs in them. So if you put, uh, if one of them encounters a deadlock, then that carries over to uh, the, the other copies. So you can imagine taking the signature from one and distributing it to the others in the population. Yes? So let's go back to, to Jeff's question a little bit, which is you are you're generalizing based on the, the post fix of the test. Um, but I could imagine when you actually take an executable and you move it to a different environment, you running onto the same application code, but it may be dynamically linked to a slightly different versions of the library underneath it. And as long as those libraries are it may be bugs in libraries, and that's a separate issue. But if the bug remains in the application, the call trace when it gets to a system call or gets to a log may look different, but the behavior from the application point of view is entirely the same. But it's because it's using a slightly different version of the library, the postfix is going to look different. Have you seen that at all? Or is that so are, you're referring to a case where the application does, is not the one that calls p3 mutex lock, but it calls some library which then calls p3 mutex lock. Right, because it's not buggy. Right? <laughs> uh, but you know, if I had a different Keypress version or I had a different C from libc or something mm -hmm. um, where the application was still going to run into deadlock because the bug was in the app, not the library, but using a different version of the library so the, the postfix of the call trace is going to be different. Yeah, so, that, so it does this entire ecosystem that ends up on the call stack has to be the same. Uh, and there's, I think, a... Uh, you know, another instance of that is, again, if you think about the browser example, one browser may have a particular plugin that deadlocks, but the other copy of the browser may not have that plugin, in which case it doesn't make sense to take the signature from this one and carry it over to that one. So it's analogous in the sense that the, the combination, it, it's the combination of elements in the system that causes the deadlock, but that combination is now slightly different. So uh, we, the, the way we want to deal with this, we haven't implemented yet, but it's to capture in the signature information that is relevant. So for instance, if you see calls that come from other libraries, you may capture their rev number in the signature. Uh, same with the plugin. If, if there's a particular configuration in which this deadlocks, you want to capture some information about that. A further problem occurs when you do an upgrade. So what happens with the signatures that you had in version 3.0 and now you upgrade to 3.1 and code moved, you know, now it's no longer libraries but it's your own code that moved around. So there, there's sort of the, uh, you know, academic ivory towerish approach of, oh, we can do very static analysis to look at the translation and so on. But I think in practice what will work the, the best will be to just uh, uh, rely on this automatic disabling of signatures 
because the old signatures that no longer apply will be constant false positives. So eventually you'll see, oh, you know, I have all these false positives, just throw that signature out. So it kind of will take care of itself if we don't come up with some clever technique to, to carry the signatures over. Oh, so one thing I should mention about vaccination is that you can imagine a, a situation where you're a, you're a vendor, software vendor, and you're distributing this code, and you, you find during testing a bunch of bugs, and you just have to make the release. You just don't, don't have time to fix all of them, so you may choose to ship the program with Dimunix and then take some of those signatures, put them in the history, and say, okay, you know, we'll leave the bugs in there, but let them be avoided at runtime, and then fix in the next release. So let me summarize. Um, as I said, the Munich requires that the program experience the first occurrence of the deadlock in order to develop immunity against it, so that's a cost we have to incur. Uh, Dimunix will not cause deadlock-free programs to, to do anything different than they would do because, uh, you know, deadlock, no deadlocks means no signatures, so Dimunix will never get in the way if it's deadlock-free. Uh, it also cannot induce a program to produce incorrect outputs unless that program is real-time, meaning it depends on the schedule, because all Dimunix does is it chooses a different schedule for your threads. And finally, Dimunix has to know about all synchronization mechanisms. If you use some sort of your own homegrown busy weight loops in combination with P-thread mutexes, Dimunix has to know that those are synchronization functions so that it can actually keep track of them. Well, I already gave you the example use uh, with the browser. Uh, an example for how end users might uh, take advantage of Dimunix is say you're running a a uh, legacy database server that is deadlock prone. It hangs every week or every month. Uh, and you, you know, you're a cash-strapped internet startup in, you know, during a, a, a economic crisis and you don't want to pay to upgrade your system to the next version, which the vendor promises they have no deadlocks. Uh, you would just take Dimunix and use it to defend yourself against the two, three deadlocks that occur every now and then, right? So Dimunix is very good for rare events, which do not warrant the effort to actually fix them. So we have a version of Dimunix uh, 1.0. Uh, the thing I'm most proud about is that uh, it, it achieves low overhead without, getting, without requiring any assistance from programmers. As I said, no annotations. Uh, no changes in the way you write code. And in closing, uh, what you've seen so far was deadlock immunity, but you can see that this approach can be applied to a number of other bad behaviors, uh, one of which are, is resource leaks. Uh, this is something that you know, we just are starting to look at applying immunity to uh, this problem. Another one is poor performance, and actually I, I had some trouble formulating this. Initially I was calling it performance immunity, but something about that didn't sound right. So in, instead I, uh, I'm going now for poor performance immunity. The idea here is that, you know, as, as I said, you're selecting thread schedules, and some schedules may lead to bad performance, some schedules may lead to good performance, so why not choose the ones that lead to good performance and do away with the bad ones? And finally, uh, one other area is to uh, defend against pathological inputs. What I mean is you have a program, it has bugs, and then there's certain inputs that trigger those bugs. So you have two options. You can either fix the bugs or you can prevent those bad inputs from ever coming into the program. Either way, we'll fix the issue. So we would like to use these immunity techniques to learn which these inputs are and try to avoid them. And there's been a lot of work done in this space, particularly in terms of security, uh, you know, look, doing using program analysis and so on. We want to see if we can achieve the same results with this pure dynamic runtime approach. And that's it. So I talked to you about one of the bullets in this picture. Uh, if we are meeting later today, I'll be happy to talk about the rest of the picture. Um, if uh, we have now time for a few questions, I'd love to take them.
So that's a tough one. Uh, we don't have the answer yet, but the, uh, the, the approach we're pursuing is instead of tweaking the, the schedule itself, is tweaking whether we provide the requested resources or not. So if you think about the schedule, it's someone's asking for a mutex and you may be holding them off and giving the mutex later. Here, it, the lever would be, uh, you know, sort of you, you do, uh, it, we're looking specifically at file descriptors. That seems like an easier problem for now. But I mean, okay, I see. So you, you rearrange the order in which they get, because I'm thinking if somebody, if, if a piece of code is just opening files and not closing them, right, that does seem less kind of. So the, Deterministic leaks, it's hard to do anything about them. The good news is that deterministic leaks are easy to find and fix. The problematic ones are the ones that are dependent, for instance, on uh, you have some error, and on the error handling path, you forget to, really, to close the file. Normally you do, but then you forget to, uh, to do it on this other path. And actually, I think these, uh, these studies, for instance, that the Stanford folks did about you know, finding bugs uh, kind of confirms this, that it's usually, you know, the exceptional branches that uh, forget to either clear interrupts or free resources. So how would you fix that, though? Because in order not to grant the resource in the first place, you'd have to know that the bug will occur, that it won't be released iteratively. So that's where the learning component comes in. You have to figure out that when certain things happen, that led to a leak. So if you see those things happening again, maybe you try to avoid them from happening, or you avoid giving the program what it is that it would leak. So I just sort of ties in with my question. So I think your leveraging here seems to be that when a deadlock occurs, you can actually look at the current state and figure out what the signature should be prevented in the future. Mm -hmm. But in a general program failure, like say, That's very true, and I should mention two things. One is, if you think back to Dimunix, we weren't looking at the end state there either, because the end state was not enough information. Remember, we were actually collecting on these edges information during the execution, information we might need in the signature. Because when, you know, if you just look at the call stacks of threads that are deadlocked, it's too late. That information will not tell you how to avoid getting into it. You need the call stacks of the outer locks, which are, you know, have vanished by the time you got to the inner locks. So that's the case for Dimunix. But your intuition is right, because in the case of resource leaks, the problem is much more difficult. Namely, you have to look at more of the execution than just you know, the last lock sequence. Uh, and you know, it's, it's by no, I think deadlocks are an easier problem than resource leaks. Yes? So you did lock a string for that thing, the violate live. For resource leaks, how do you identify that it's actually a resource leak and it's a problem versus, you know, I really think we should leave this forever? That's, you know, that comes back to the, to the fact that deadlocks are, again, a very clean example. Uh, there are various ways to infer the leak issue. One is, it depends, right? If you have a program that runs forever, uh, there you have to infer. If the program you know, gets to the end and you see that things haven't been uh, released, you know, kind of what Valgrind does, uh, you, you try to infer based on that. But the detection of the leak right now what we're working with is purely one of usage. So there are certain, if you think about file descriptors, if you create a file descriptor and then you use it for a while and then there's no more activity, there is actually a very small class of legitimate behaviors that, that would justify that. For instance, uh, you know, if you open a log file, you might open it at startup and then not write anything to it. That's not a leak. It, it's okay. But other than that, so right now we're going down that path. It's an early project. Uh, we don't have the answers yet, but uh, that's the direction we're taking.
I think what you're asking is, do we have a sense of how many of the deadlock that exist in the code end up being detected and put in the history in order to be avoided? Is that what you mean by coverage? Not, not quite. Um, so if you were to take the code and then use some sort of static deadlock detection techniques, um, do you think you would get better coverage than the static, like sort of state of the art static detection techniques? Uh, so I'm not sure what you mean by coverage um, in this context. I think static techniques get them all, if they're sound and complete, yeah. Uh, they get them all. The problem is static analysis has to be conservative, so it ends up with many false positives, typically. So tools like Coverity and so on, they have you know work for real programs. What they end up doing is sacrificing the completeness in order to reduce the false positive rate. So in those cases, we actually spoke to the Coverity guys, uh, and you know after fair amount of dealing, we, we managed to get a copy of their uh, software. Uh, and one of the things we do want to do is run that software and then compare, uh, you know, do it. one of the areas that is interesting is to uh, take some of the false positives and see if you can validate them with Diminix, okay. right? Uh, but it's, uh, it's tricky to compare to these tools because they have all these knobs. And for instance, the Coverity tools allow you to vary the amount of completeness. You say, oh, I want very few false positives, so then it, it does a very crappy job, but legitimately so. You know, you, so it, the comparison is not easy, but at least for our own education, it's, it would be a good one to do. But there's definitely a lot of synergy between static analysis and Diminix. One example is that you, could, you can imagine statically determining that certain parts of the code are not deadlock prone. And so there's no point in doing any of the instrumentation in there. And if, so if you have the ability to run static analysis, that could trim the amount of instrumentation you do and the overhead, of course. We haven't done it yet, but I, I suspect it could be substantial. Okay. All right, let's thank George. Thank you.